Okay. Welcome to meeting of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. I will begin by taking roll. Rashan? Present. Reynoldson? Present. Falmouth? Here. Fleischman? Here. Hamilton? I thought I spot Stephen. Well, and um, reminders, didn't Stephen have a court appearance this afternoon as well? I think he was ha had a court appearance this afternoon, um, but uh, was going to be <laughs> traveling and maybe he's, he's just, he's on mute. I see him here. Um, uh, Judge Harper? Um, Hardston? Here. Kirkmeyer? Here. McRae? Here. Olvera? Here. Justice Petro? Here. Robinson? Here. Judge Rubin? Shining? Here. Sarouche? Here. Spiro? Here. Torres Ambriz? Present. Judge Wiley? Present. Judge Yu? Okay. We yeah, have Linda, a forum. Linda, it's Stephen Hamilton. I'm here. I just couldn't hear it on my phone. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so do you want to go ahead and take up the minutes so that those don't get um, shoved off at the end again? Sure. Um, does someone want to make a motion to approve the minutes? Either there's three, there's minutes from Mar February 26, March 18, and March 26. So if if you want, someone could make a motion for all three of those, or we could take them up separately. Well, it depends if we have someone who's able to make a motion who is in attendance at all three. Do we have anyone? I was I there. Stand, this I'm in I'm sorry. I make approval of all three. I send me an email. Okay. Hold on a moment. Do we have a second? Elizabeth can second that motion. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and let me just note that Judge Harper is now online. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, but you know what? He's somehow in the attendees, and so we need to move him over to panelist. I will do that. Um, okay. All right, and I will note um, Judge Harper's presence in the role. One moment. Um, okay, so shall I go ahead and uh, call the vote? Yes. In a minute. Okay. Um, Rashawn? Yes. Reynoldson? Yes. Falmouth? Yes, sorry. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? Yes. Hardston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Uh, Robinson? Yes. Judge Rubin? I haven't seen Judge Rubin. Let me just say that Judge Rubin is actually texting me right now and has misplaced the link. So when you're done um, doing this portion of it, Linda, if you could please email him the link yeah. for the meeting, he will log on. Okay. Um, Shining? Yes. Sarush? Yes. Byro? Byro? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, so are you is that a yes vote for the minutes? Yes. Torres Ambriz? Yes. Uh, Judge Wiley? Yes. And I believe Judge Yu is absent. Correct. Okay. 
Okay, the, that the motion carries, and I will go in and uh, resend the link to Judge Rubin. Yeah, let's hold on a moment so that you have the opportunity to do that before we run into something else. Justice Petrude, uh, Justice, oh, there he is. I, I'm sorry about the confusion. He's here. It's a miracle. Great. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, yeah, Judge Rubin. Is. Okay. And um, all right. So I think that's that. So uh, any other housekeeping matters, Linda? No. Okay. So could we please, um, for the attendees, and we're here, of course, today solely to discuss fee caps. We're not getting into other things today. If any attendees have any comments that they wish to make in regards to fee caps, um, if you could please raise your, you know, virtual hand. I'm going to take a moment so I can see how many there are. Okay, I see three people. Um, Linda, if you could please call them a three minute cap per person, please. Sure. Okay. Um, Tom Gordon. Thank you. My name is Tom Gordon. I'm the executive director of Responsive Law. Uh, we're a national nonprofit organization working on behalf of consumers of legal services. We've testified a few times in front of this committee and some of its subgroups, and we've also uh, recently submitted a letter along with Stanford Center for the Legal Profession on this topic. And I just wanted to take a, a deeper dive into uh, one particular issue. We've uh, expressed several of our policy concerns, but I wanted to mention a more practical concern for uh, this committee or whoever end, would end up setting fee caps. And that's that uh, it is going to be unwieldy to say the least. Uh, when you look at the existing fee caps in certain sub areas of law, it's based on an hourly rate. And so at most you're dealing with uh, hourly rates based on experience and maybe some variation on geography. Uh, but one of the likely scenarios for uh, legal paraprofessionals is going to be flat fees for various types of services. So I wanted to look at one area of potential practice, that's family law, and within that one particular service, a name change, and run through some of the, uh, the, some of the potential fees that a regulator would have to set a cap for. For instance, what about drafting a name change petition for an adult, including filing it with, uh, with the court? What if they, you do that same name change uh, petition for an adult, but you have the client self-file? What if you draft that name change petition for the adult, and you include filing it and uh, include completing forms to change the person's name with relevant government agencies. What about a fee cap for drafting a name change petition for an adult that includes filing with the court and completing forms to change it with relevant government agencies and with any uh, number of private entities that may need to see that name change. What if you do all those any of those services as a rush for a 24 hour turnaround or a 48 hour turnaround or a one week turnaround. What if you're looking at a name change petition for a minor for self-filing with filing in all those different permutations and combinations in a rush, not in a rush? Uh, what if you're doing that in a two for one special and two minors in the same family? Is that a separate fee cap? What if you're looking at a name and gender change petition for self-filing, for filing by the paralegal, uh, for filing with government agencies, for filing with government agencies and private entities? Uh, and we're looking at just one service here. That's just for a name change petition out of all the areas of family law where uh, a paraprofessional could practice, out of all the areas in any other area of law where paraprofessionals will be available to practice. 30 uh, seconds factoring remaining. On, factoring in on top of that, again, levels of experience will be different. Location will be different. There could be surge pricing. Certain services could become uh, more in demand at certain times of the year. So given all these constraints, there would be thousands, tens of thousands, potentially millions, uh, without exaggeration, of different fees that would be required to be set by a regulator. Uh, for the reasons we mentioned in our, uh, in our letter, this is a problem in search, a solution in search of a problem. Thank you. Mike, Michael Barth. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, uh, yes, my name is, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Barth. I'm a staff attorney with Public Counsel, um, presenting comments on behalf of multiple legal service organizations. Um, there's been input from Public Law Center, Bedsetic, Neighborhood Legal Services, uh, Legal Aid Foundation of LA, 
and the Legal Aid Society of San Diego. Um, first, I want to note some of our underlying concerns about the paraprofessional program before delving into the fee caps. Uh, we believe that the proposed program does not directly address the issues identified in the justice gap and may not actually provide a solution as such. Um, there are other current and pending proposals that address the justice gap more directly, community navigators, community education. Um, there's been recent changes to the bar exam pass score and authorization of provisionally licensed lawyers. Um, there are other options like increasing the income limit for IELTA funded organizations, increasing funding in general. Uh, we believe it's premature to roll out a paraprofessional program when we don't know the impact of all those other current and pending proposals. Uh, and essentially, we disagree with the, the concept that something is better than nothing, where here uh, we're concerned that the justice gap will either remain the same or be widened if it becomes the norm that low and moderate income individuals are essentially given a choice uh, for legal services between a paraprofessional as opposed to pursuing other means to address the justice gap and a true justice system would give an individual uh, a true choice. Um, now regarding fee caps, uh, we do support the idea that the paraprofessional program should include fee regula regulation. Uh, most other legal programs do as a common consumer protection. Um, some possible options, um, create a fee structure, much like the structure for chapter 13 bankruptcy attorneys for different substantive topics. Consider a sliding scale fee structure where the paraprofessional's hourly fee is capped based on the income of the client. Uh, we do not believe para paraprofessionals should be allowed to demand up full upfront fees. Um, at an absolute minimum, paraprofessionals must be required to report the fees charged for different services in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the program. Um, simply put, uh, fee regulations will reduce the harm caused by fraudulent behavior. Um, all this being said, um, fee regulations will only do so much as clients may not, um, may still, uh, you know, be uh, be pressured into taking a paraprofessional where other options such as legal aid organizations are available. Uh, 30 seconds do, remaining. Thank you. Uh, we provide these comments regarding the need to rethink the program and to also make sure that robust consumer protections are accounted for. Thank you very much. Angela Grijalva. Thank you, good morning all, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, uh, paraprofessionals are going to inherently be lower in cost uh, in relation to attorney's oh, fees. Um, it's highly unlikely that the public will pay a paraprofessional for services at the attorney rate. I think in terms of market, the, it, the fees will just inherently be lower. Please keep in mind that paraprofessionals must, just like I do as an LDA, we just, we yeah, must I mean, turn a profit yeah, in order to operate our businesses. Uh, and the other thing I would ask that you keep in mind is that these fee caps will roll downhill, meaning that it will impact LDA's incomes. So for example, if you set the fee cap for a name change, which on average I'm finding right now for LDA's is about $200, $250, if you set the fee cap to $100, for example, for a simple name change, not uh, accounting for the other uh, brushes, genders, or any other minor or other, a simple, simple uh, name change that will inherit, see if you set it for $100, it will impact LDAs. And we have to set our pricing according to our costs and that's impacted by county um, and uh, other costs, uh, for example, our software, everything that we need that anyone needs to operate a business. So I just ask that you keep this in mind, whatever fee caps you make here will not just impact this industry, but it will uh, also impact other uh, paraprofessional or quasi-professional uh, industries such as LDAs, UDAs, so on and so forth. Thank you. Linda. Sorry, Alexis Givre, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Hello? Alexis Givre, we can't hear you, you are unmuted. Uh, 
Uh, well, I'm not sure what's happening here. Should, uh, Justice Petru, did you wanna uh, move on? That was the last, this is the last speaker and apparently we can't hear them. All right, and if the speaker comes back in later and um, you know raises their hand again, we can try. But yes, I think we should move on. And I think, um, Leah, if you're ready, I think it would be helpful to do the overview with the PowerPoint before we have our, commence our group discussion. Yes. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, Linda. This PowerPoint is really just uh, intended to be a very quick, um, overview of the material that was posted um, in support of this meeting and the discussion today. This first slide lays out, I think, the two primary questions. One, should paraprofessional fees be capped? And if so, how should those caps be set? Um, and so you can see on the slide, we've laid out a couple of different options, none at all, caps in all practice areas, caps for some practice areas, and then different possibilities uh, for how fee caps should be set. Um, I also want to, to note that something that I uh, did not include in the memo, but was uh, requested by at least one member of the working group was sort of an overarching question of um, the legality of setting fee caps, particularly vis-a-vis -vis antitrust concerns. And so I do have, um, an attorney here from the Office of General Counsel who can quickly speak to that as well, because I, I wanna make sure that we touch on that issue. Uh, what I'm gonna do, James, if you have a couple moments though, is just go quickly through the slides and then ask you to speak to the antitrust issue. Will that work for you? Sounds good, yes. All right, so can we go to the next slide, Linda? So we were- And I would, um, Leah, if I could just jump in for a second, I appreciate you're trying to do this quickly, but I actually think that the PowerPoint is very helpful. It's a very helpful overview, which of course people don't have the opportunity to see before. So I'd encourage you to not go too quickly. Okay, all right. All of, all of the information is in, in the memo though to, to reiterate that. So um, I think here with this, the second piece of this, if there's a decision to cap fees, uh, I think we really are going to have to grapple with how the fees are going to be set. Um, and that I think is going to be uh, quite challenging. Um, and so uh, you can see here some of the considerations, including whether there will be exceptions to any fee caps. And if so, how will those exceptions be exercised? Um, and how would the caps be reviewed and revised? So if we could go forward. So uh, yeah, we were able to find um, a number of different statutory caps, both state and federal. Uh, interestingly, I did not come across the chapter 13 uh, caps that were referenced by our public commenter, but I did look them up just now. Um, so I think I'll kind of weave that into the discussion. Um, there are met, the caps that exist, I would say, are primarily around fee awards uh, rather than governing in the first instance what a private client can pay their lawyer up front. Um, but they're, they're more around fee awards where you do see uh, limitations on, on what uh, an attorney can earn sort of directly from their client uh, outside of fee awards is the limits on contingency fees. And so we have some of these uh, listed out here. They're quite different, these various limitations. And we did provide all of the detail on this as an attach one or two of the appendices to the memo. Um, but I think the, the main point or the main takeaway is there are a number of statutory uh, examples, both state and federal. Do you want to move forward, Linda? Um, so going sort of segueing to this bankruptcy example, which I just looked up, these are presumptive uh, fee award of presumptive um, attorney fees. So guidelines for presumptive fees that attorneys will be paid uh, in bankruptcy proceedings, similar to the presumptive fees 
that uh, superior court set for certain case types that we also referenced in the memo. And these presumptive fees vary uh, not just by district uh, court, federal district court, but within each division. So you have different fees, for example, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Santa Rosa. Uh, e each uh, division is setting its own fees, but there are presumptive fees, it appears. So, and, and Leah, just so that I understand, and I'm sorry, because I got um, waylaid by a text for a moment here. These yeah. fees that you're talking about, are these fees when counsel is being then paid by the courts as opposed to being paid by private individuals? No, I think in a, I'm not familiar with bankruptcy proceedings, but I believe this is the amount that the bankruptcy attorney can charge from the client's assets billed to the, whatever it is that's paying for the overall bankruptcy proceeding. I don't believe, mm -hmm. it, I don't believe this is court appointed. Uh, this is court funded. These look like uh, fees that are taken from the assets uh, involved in the bankruptcy. But again, I'm no expert. And no, I know. And I think it's actually more helpful for us to understand what happens in the context of California. Okay. So really just trying to provide broad overview. There are state and federal examples of limits on hourly fees, contingency fees, et cetera. If we could go forward, Linda. We also have, and this uh, is the example I was referencing in relation to the bankruptcy fees, there are fees set by superior courts. So there are local court rules that limit um, or they establish presumptively reasonable contingency fee awards. And in fewer courts, actual limits on fees that can be charged in unlawful detainer actions. And, and Linda, you can confirm that these are fees that are paid by clients, not fees paid by the court. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And in, in all of these rules, they provide, what's provided is th that if the, a, a request for fees falls within these limits, then those are just presumed to be reasonable and they can be uh, ministerially awarded by the clerks in many instances. But the attorney has the option to petition for additional fees. These are just presumptively reasonable. And then you have court appointed counsel rates. And these rates are the rates uh, that are paid to attorneys whose services are funded by a government entity, either by the court, by a county, um, but th these are government funded legal services, uh, different funding sources. But here we are not talking about clients paying a fee. There are many different types of court appointed counsel rates. We included, I think we highlighted in the memo, some that might be most applicable to our program. Uh, I think we included misdemeanor uh, rates and family law 3150, but there are many different types of court appointed counsel rates. If you go forward. And then we have the modest means panels. And here, uh, what was, interesting is that uh, it appears that few programs actually limit the fees that attorneys can charge. So there, it's called a modest means panel. And, and, and Leah, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt you again, but before we get to the modest um, means panels, I just want to make sure I have clear in my head. If we, focusing on the state, not federal, okay, mm -hmm. and taking aside, uh, putting to the side contingency, you know, what percentage of a contingency award could an attorney get what are the areas in which there is just a flat out, if any, just a flat out, um, you know, as, as Linda possibly said, you know, presumptively reasonable, but just a flat limitation. I'm trying to get my mind around where does California currently place, can't really call it a fee cap when it's presumptive, but, you know, something akin to a fee cap for all the services that are provided by an attorney. Uh, separate from contingency fees. I would say this probate code 10810, even though it's under contingency fees on this slide, it's kind of mislabeled. This is amounts the personal representative is able to charge for their services um, based on it's uh, based on the value of the estate. So it's not a contingency fee, right. it's simply based on the value of the estate. Um, if you go forward, Linda, none of the rest of the none of the rest of these statutes go forward. And then I, I believe this 
limit on the fees in the unlawful detainer actions in 21 courts. These are, are flat fees, a presumptive fee, but, uh, but a fee established nonetheless paid by a client, you know, mm -hmm. private client to an attorney. So those would be the two instances in the state system. Okay. Okay. So now if we go to the modest means panel, if you can, I think you're going, yeah. Um, and I'm gonna uh, ask Linda to speak a little bit more to this, but it, it, it actually was a little difficult to find programs that actually set caps on what attorneys can charge. Um, we did find some and we included that in the memo and I don't know, Linda, if you want to elaborate on, on that at all, sort of what was more typical in terms of what we learned about how these programs do or do not uh, cap fees. So what we found was uh, in the few that do have any limits on fees, um, and, and I'm, I'm, it might be helpful to, to show uh, the summary from the, slide, from the uh, memo. I'm going to just move to that. And you can see that um, the, and, and we provided more detail in the attachments, but the, um, the Contra Costa Bar Association has a modest means panel and, and they list the income eligibility requirements for two different levels and the rates that can be charged. Um, but as I discussed in the memo that we got information from them that that has been, that program has been suspended for the moment while they revisit the requirements. And one of the issues was they have found that it's not, if someone um, is referred to someone, to an attorney to provide services on a reduced fee basis and that the attorney is limited to charging $80 per hour, um, it's, it's, uh, it's not really reasonable to expect the attorney to provide unlimited services at that rate. So they're looking at the potential of providing a cap on those fees. Um, the Orange County Bar Association has this limit of $125 an hour. Um, the Los Angeles and San Diego bars have these flat fee programs. Um, it's very limited in terms of what the attorney uh, the services that are provided and they're laid out again the, the we provided pages uh, from their websites that detail the types of services that are provided at these flat fee rates um the, and they and while the contra costa and orange county and san diego county bars do the sc eligibility screening to look at the client's income and ask for proof of, of eligibility, what their income is before making these referrals. The Los Angeles County Bar uh, will refer someone and leave it to the attorney to do the screening and to determine whether the person is eligible for the flat fee services and, and then to negotiate these rates. These, these fees in, in my conversation with them, is, are, they serve more as a guideline um, and it's sort of a, a starting point. So if the attorney agrees that the person qualifies for those fees, they might charge those fees, but otherwise they, they, the attorney, it's left to the attorney to determine whether the person qualifies. Okay. And with respect to the um, income eligibility for the clients, I think this is a, a really important point that I just want to emphasize that the modest means panels, uh, at least ostensibly, have some kind of concept of screening clients for income eligibility. I think when we did um, the analysis for Contra Costa, if you could go back to the PowerPoint, Linda, when we did the analysis for Contra Costa, the um, high level income, that level two clients, I, I think it went up to about 233% of the federal poverty level. So these are, are folks who in, in some instances or, or many instances may be eligible for uh, legal aid or some legal aid programs that go up that high. Um, 
so that was the cap for the Contra Costa program. So I think that's that's an important point that uh, there are income limitations on the clients that are being served by these modest means programs. And their and their income is being assessed by the court. No, no, not by the court. Your income is either being assessed by a bar association that runs the program or by, as Linda mentioned in the Los Angeles instance, the lawyer, him or herself, is expected to do this. And these are modest means panels. This is where the um, client is paying the attorney. Um, but the, uh, the attorney has particip chosen to participate on a modest means panel of a local bar association which sets these, these, well, as we were trying to clarify, very few of them actually set a cap. A few of them do. And uh, that cap only applies to eligible clients and eligible clients have to be under a certain income level. And what I'm just trying to point out is where we were able to do the analysis, the income level uh, for the cap was quite low. The highest income was 233% of FPL, the federal poverty level. And, um, and that's pretty low. So for example, you know, for a family of five, um, it's a $5,000 a month would be your gross income, no more than Okay, you want to go forward, Linda? In terms of other legal professionals, we were not able to find any fee caps at all for legal document assistance, for immigration consultants, for unlawful detainer assistance, um, nor in looking at the other states that either have or are planning to have a paraprofessional program were there any fee caps imposed, um, nor in Ontario, that's the reference to the province. In terms of methodology, moving on to the second part, um, if you all do decide to establish a fee cap, at least in some areas, uh, the next question will be how to establish it. So in looking at possible methodologies, we tried to better understand where fee caps have been set, what, what's the methodology that's been employed. So for court-appointed counsel, um, you know, the best I, I could get uh, from speaking to folks involved in this work and in some local courts is it's an organic process. Uh, that's a quote from somebody I talked to. Um, basically looking at what neighboring uh, courts are paying and trying to just get a sense of what the market will, will bear. There's a lot of kind of back and forth with local attorneys that folks think will serve on these uh, panels and trying to figure out what, what rates, you know, how low can we go while still uh, having sufficient um, attorneys to take cases from the panel. Uh, I think Linda, it sounded like there was something a little bit more structure for modest means panel. Do you wanna describe that? That actually, Justin is, uh had conversations with the people at, and I don't know that Justin's been introduced to the full working group, okay. yet, but, um, but, but Justin is another analyst. Uh, he's a, with uh, the, the state bar and he's recently joined the paraprofessional program uh, working group staff. And Justin did the research into the modest means panels and how um, they set their rates. And in speaking with them, they kind of did a formal survey of their membership. So it was the, the local bar association and got what they were setting the fees at for certain types of things. Cause you saw it was a limited flat fee schedule. And then they also kind of went outside of their membership and surveyed the market to see how that compared with their membership. And then it was kind of a, we're just going to pin it at one point. There wasn't really a methodology on the reduction from the market rate, but they chose a number below the market rate for those several different flat fees and then resurveyed their membership to see whether or not their members were interested in providing services for the um, people that qualified for those rates. And so how they determined how much lower than the market rate to go wasn't, you know, scientific, but it was, they did survey their membership to try and obtain where they should set those flat fees. Okay, we can go forward. Yeah. 
We also shared with you uh, the, the quite, uh, I think, comprehensive methodology um, that really Linda and I established for Dependency Council uh, funding in California. And that is um, a very uh, structured approach which uses regions, uh, statewide regions. Those are the same statewide regions used initially in the transition from county to state funding of the trial courts, um, pegging uh, the dependency council uh, rates to county council salaries. So this is dependency council for both parents and children in dependency proceedings who are paid for by the state, uh, but pegging their salaries to county council and then adding in additional factors for support staff, uh, benefits and overhead. Um, that methodology, as I think we tried to lay out, it is dependent on having a number of other sort of inputs uh, that you can use to peg uh, an appointed rate to. And then another option um, might be to simply um, try to cap paraprofessional rates as a, per, as a percentage of attorney hourly rates. And one of the challenges that we have there, of course, is that attorneys are not required to report to the bar what their hourly rates are, or what their flat fee rates are, or what, their, what their fees are in general. Uh, the two data, best data sources that we have are the Clio data, uh, which has been provided to you, as well as 2017 data from a state bar survey. And I think, I believe we had about 6,000 um, to 7,000 attorneys providing the rate information. Um, and so we've provided everything we have to you in terms of rates and, and by uh, county and case type where available. Uh, so that would be another sort of potential uh, option. And I think that may be it. Um, if I could just turn to James quickly to speak to the question of whether or not uh, we would be allowed to set fee caps, if that would be legal, and then maybe we can take questions and move into the discussion or Justice Petru, I'll, I'll turn to you to see how, how you wanna do things next, but let me ask James to speak quickly to the antitrust issues. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, I'm James Chang. I'm an attorney with the State Bar's Office of General Counsel responsible for monitoring the state bar's compliance with the antitrust laws. Um, I'm here today to respond to a question that has been raised as to whether there would be any potential antitrust violations associated with uh, enacting fee caps in the paraprofessional program. And the quick answer to that question is no, there are unlikely to be any antitrust um, issues. And the reason for that um, is first, because this is a form of government regulation and second, because this policy is unlikely to be anti-competitive. Let me break those down uh, for you. So the first is, as a general matter, government regulation of pricing does not violate the antitrust laws. Um, the United States Supreme Court has held that state action is exempt from the antitrust laws because the purpose of the antitrust laws is to um, regulate private anti-competitive conduct. Um, this is the case of Parker v. Brown, 1943, uh, in which the Supreme Court uh, analyzed the history of the Sherman Antitrust Act and determined that its purpose was not to restrain the state from activities directed by its legislature. Um, thus, we see that price controls of all sorts are relatively common. Uh, for example, the federal government has um, enacted explicit fee caps on uh, debit card fees, as well as on um, internet domain name registrations, to name a few examples. And of course, there are also um, state caps on attorney fees. One example of that that we've been discussing um, in uh, California has been MICRA, which caps contingency, contingency fees in medical malpractice actions. Um, so whenever it is the state um, that is enacting any type of price control, it's generally going to be exempt from antitrust laws um, simply by virtue of the fact that it is state regulation. And so that is why, uh, for example, MICRA um, it, you know, continues to be valid law. It has not um, been successfully challenged on antitrust grounds or for that matter, um, on other constitutional grounds as well. And so um, 
with respect to MICRA, um, there have been many published decisions um, affirming the constitutionality of MICRA and finding that the legislature had valid authority to um, cap the contingency fees in the medical malpractice cases. So the first reason that you're not going to have um, antitrust issues with price caps uh, here is because it's going to be a form of regulation, government regulation. And that argument will be the strongest if these caps are enacted directly by the legislature in statute or by the Supreme Court acting in a legislative capacity by enacting them through a rule of court. Um, the state action immunity attaches most strongly when the policy is enacted by the state itself. And so the legislature and the Supreme Court as the sovereign arms of the state, um, if they enact any type of policy, it's um, virtually unquestionable at that point that that is state regulation exempt from the antitrust laws. There is, um, uh, you know, kind of a separate analysis when you're talking about delegated authority from the legislature or the Supreme Court uh, to another body, which does not have explicit statutory authority. Um, in those cases, sometimes there may be a more intensive analysis to determine whether state action immunity applies, um, but you would still have to resolve the threshold question of whether there is an anti-competitive policy. That is whether there is some type of antitrust violation at all. And generally with price caps, you're not likely going to have an anti-competitive um, policy. And the reason for that is that price caps benefit the consumers and harm the producers. And so you're not talking about some type of self-interested activity where you're maintaining artificially high prices that benefit the paraprofessionals or benefit attorneys. And so, um, you know, while there have been cases in which um, attorney price regulation has been found to not, sorry, not price regulation, but attorney pricing has implicated the antitrust laws, uh, th that's not going to be the case here. And a, a particular example of this is uh, the United States Supreme Court case of Goldfarb versus State Bar in 1975, in which the Virginia State Bar had set out minimum fee schedules for their attorneys. And so basically they required that all of the attorneys in the state who provided certain services had to charge minimum fees. That policy of course was hurting consumers because it prevented uh, attorneys from competing with each other for lower pricing that would have benefited consumers. When you're talking about price caps here, you actually have the opposite situation where uh, you're going to be benefiting consumers because the um, pair professionals will not be able to charge over a certain amount. And so you're not having a policy here that is actually protecting um, the producers of the service. And so you're unlikely to have um, the threshold uh, element of an antitrust claim, which is some kind of anti-competitive conduct, because the policy here is actually um, pro-consumer, pro-competitive in some sense. Um, just as a final note, you know, if I, I know we're fairly on in this process and we haven't developed the structure for how price caps would be enacted, if at all, um, of course, if the price caps were enacted directly by the legislature or by the Supreme Court, that ends the analysis because it's directed by sovereign arm of the state. If there is some type of delegated authority and there is some type of anti-competitive conduct, then um, the policy would still enjoy state action immunity if it can be shown that it's pursuant to a clearly articulated state policy and subject to active state supervision. And that's um, those are the factors articulated by the US Supreme Court in the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners versus Federal Trade Commission case. And so um, even if you end up in a situation where the working group is delegated authority to set specific rates and there is some type of um, credible accusation that the that policy is anti-competitive, as long as you can show that the statute or rule um, delegating this authority to the working group specifically um, articulates the state's policy that the group have this authority to set those rates, and that there is some type of mechanism where a sovereign arm of the state, like the legislature or the Supreme Court, continues to actively supervise uh, the working group's exercise of this delegated authority, then again, you're still likely going to be able to enjoy state action immunity. So um, uh, perhaps this was a, a more long-winded explanation than you were looking for, but um, you know what, what I can tell you at this stage is that um, 
having reviewed the proposal, um, our office does not see any antitrust concerns or, or any legal concerns that would prevent you from moving on to the next stage and considering whether these price caps um, are a good idea as a matter of policy. All right, thank you, James. That was very helpful. Um, and I think, from my mind, fully addressed the questions that had been raised about it. So we appreciate that. Does anyone have any follow up questions for James at this point? Okay, not seeing any. Um, my thought is that, you know, before we delve down into details, we need to make the fundamental decision of whether there should be fee caps at all. Um, before having a conversation, if we are having a conversation about what those would look like. Um, there are a couple of ways to go about it. I, I honestly, you know, I have no way of knowing um, who has, you know, reviewed the materials, whether people are ready to state their positions about this. So before getting into that, if anyone would like to just talk, um, I think it's a good time to have a discussion about people's general thoughts about whether there should be fee caps. Fleischman. Yeah, I'm in favor of fee caps. First, I want to thank the staff for putting this material together. I went through it over the weekend. It was very comprehensive and very helpful. Um, I think if we're going to take our role in as um, that this program should include consumer protection aspects seriously, there should be some types of caps, at least in some areas. I don't think one size fits all. I don't think the average consumer is sophisticated enough to deal with hourly billing in the traditional sense, like insurance companies or uh, Fortune 500 companies that where hourly billing is more common. Um, I see a lot of means for miscommunications, misunderstandings of budget, and simply things taking longer than a consumer would expect. But I also, like I said, I don't think one size fits all. I think name changes, gender changes, and collateral criminal are low hanging fruit that we can figure out a reasonable hourly rate, a reasonable number of hours, uh, and set a cap or a flat fee for those areas. Steve Hamilton has convinced me that um, caps are not a good idea in family law, and I would defer to him on that, although I'm curious what he thinks about the uncontested divorce for $800. I think the tougher ones are consumer debt, <coughs> excuse me, and unlawful detainer. Um, you know, we heard from somebody who will take any case anywhere in the state defending consumer debt for $800. That seems to me that sets a ceiling on what we should be charging, keeping in mind that's an attorney who can take the case through a jury trial that a paraprofessional can't. An unlawful detainer, Sacramento County has a fee schedule of $750 for a contested unlawful detainer trial, which again, paraprofessionals will not be able to do the trial aspect of it. So I think we have some ceilings already in place. And I just think overall, it may not be one size fits all, but I think we should at least try to enact some consumer protections. I think heading all these issues off on the front end is better than dealing with it in fee arbitrations, having matters referred to the state bar. Um, I, I just think we're better off for everybody involved and the numbers should be high enough that paraprofessionals can make a living doing this. I'm not saying people shouldn't be able to make a living. So those are my preliminary thoughts. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Claudia? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I really appreciated the discussion earlier on yeah, why fee caps would not necessarily create an antitrust situation with regards to fee caps specifically as a consumer. I very much appreciate the idea of fee caps because that's how I make every single decision in my life. Can I afford it? How much is it going to cost me? If I don't know that there's a floor, I'm scared of that ceiling, okay? I, I can't even walk in the door without knowing that that's something that I can manage. I, I myself have so many legal problems that have never been dealt with because I don't even know. 
how much it's going to cost me to even ask about it. Um, thanks to you all, I now know that there are some systems in place through the, uh, through the board where I can actually find folks that could probably help me. But still, knowing that there may be fee caps instituted gives me some sort of security or an imagined positive outcome for people who may actually seek help if they knew that maybe they could kind of afford it. I mean, at least they would know how much money they may have to raise to deal with their issue because not knowing this, this ambiguity, this barrier to service, this lack of information is one of the main reasons why people do not seek legal help. So I am, as a consumer, extremely in favor of fee caps. And I do understand that it is also useful to make it possible for maybe requesting higher than fee caps, right? Like if the work extends beyond what the scope was originally thought to be, I understand that there may be a, a necessity for going beyond the fee cap, but at least it gives us a starting point so that I can start trying to deal with my situations. So thank you for this. Thank you, Claudia. Um, Erica? Um, I want to also thank staff for this really great comprehensive work. I was wondering how they were going to get all the information and um, they, they did a great job. I let Linda and Leah know that on Friday when I read it. Um, and I, I'm really interested in what Claudia shared. I'm thinking, however, of the letter that um, Professor Solomon or Mr. Solomon sent us. And I'm wondering if there are fee caps, how do we account for treating lawyers, like giving lawyers free reign on their fees and women and minorities who might be sort of like seen as the underclass of paraprofessionals, you know, all these fee caps such that, as they said in their example, there's a case where you have the judge, a lawyer, a paraprofessional, and the lawyer can charge whatever they want, but the paraprofessional is capped. So I'm kind of worried about that. Um, and I'm thinking perhaps we could allow for you know, parties to negotiate with their lawyers or their paraprofessionals for a set fee. Like, as Steve said, there was a lawyer who came in and his practice is completely doing a certain amount of work and they do it for $800 and they've already contracted that that's a set fee. Um, perhaps that is something that can be addressed so that consumers can have the protection of knowing how much money they're gonna be spending. Um, but I am concerned, um, cause I, I was on the State Bar Board of Governors and I'm acutely aware of what happens when they won't fund, you know, legislature doesn't wanna fund your fee bill. Um, and one of the huge things we were so happy about our year was that we got a fee bill through. And so if it's if the perception is the State Bar is too cozy with lawyers, what, what is the message that's gonna be sent? All right, thank you, Erica. If we could please for a moment, uh, Linda, could we see if this person, um, Alexis, had their hand up before we were not able to hear Alexis and has a hand up again. So if we could please see if, if now we can hear. Yes, okay. Alexis? Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. I apologize, I had some technical difficulties, but thank you so much for, um, for allowing me to speak. Um, Judge you, uh, I'm not, I took a little bit of offense when you just made the comment that the state bar is too cozy with lawyers. I just want to say I am one of the attorneys that does medical malpractice law, and I am severely restricted by caps. Um, and not only micro, but also in some of the work that I do non micro related non medical malpractice where I represent children, and there's an additional cap on fees um, when it comes to a child so that is something I don't I didn't see that that was um, addressed in any of the current in the list of caps but that is another another cap that that we have as and I am a plaintiff's lawyer so um, I work on contingency I don't get paid unless I am able to resolve a case and many times if I'm not able to resolve it in, in favor of my client or if I'm if I don't get a judgment that covers all my costs and fees I actually lose money um, and so it's really important I feel 
I feel, I think a lot of attorneys are now feeling threatened by the paraprofessional um, uh, situation that's coming down the pipeline. Um, we've put in a lot of time and effort into our education, into passing the bar. And I've been an attorney for 15 years. There's obviously many, many, many thousands that have a lot longer, um, you know, uh, time in this position than I have. And, you know, I have to deal with caps. I have to deal with contingency. And I would appreciate there being some cap also on paraprofessionals. To be really honest with you, um, I think a lot of attorneys are feeling like um, we are not valued anymore and especially by the state bar. So um, I just wanted to put that out there that I, I, I don't know that, um, I don't know who's saying the state bar is too cozy with lawyers, but it's not lawyers, that's for sure. So um, I just wanted also to, to just recognize that we do have a lot of caps um, and we're, we're still willing to take cases, taking uh, medical malpractice cases. It's, it's, a very, it's a labor of love. I don't make much money doing it. I do it because I feel that um, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, a justice that I have remaining. To and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Leah, I believe you had something. Yeah, just a quick follow up question for Judge Yu. When you said you were interested in um, being able to negotiate the rate, could you expand a little bit more on what that might look like? Are you thinking of a requirement that paraprofessionals at some point advise the client, this is the maximum I'm going to charge you or could you elaborate a little bit more on what that Sure. Means? And may I please just apologize? And I'm going to say her name wrong, Miss DeVere, Alexis. I, I was quoting someone else in their letter who said that the perception has been that the state bar has been cozy with attorneys. That's not necessarily what I'm saying for myself. And Leah, what I was thinking is, you know, I mean, lawyers negotiate right now for set fees or evergreen um, retainers and things like that. So as we we're thinking about what paraprofessionals would have to disclose, you know, I've always been saying we want them to disclose that there's alternative services in this language for language access. But I think that we also want, have said we want paraprofessionals to disclose that this, this piece of work, this assistance could be obtained through the legal community, through this legal service agency in your community um, for free potentially or whatever, that perhaps we would also have them say, you know, this is the fee that I'm requesting, but you are free to try to negotiate with me. And also in whatever agreement they enter, say, this is what I believe I will be doing for you. So that it's a negotiated cap as opposed to us putting a cap on them or whoever the regulating agency is. And also that just seems like so much work because then as inflation happens and caps change, I mean, what are you going to do? And the letter from Professor um, Solomon also said, you know, you, conceivably you could have different caps in different counties or different regions. And that just seems like a, a lot of regulation. Is there anything else, Leah? No, 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 no. All right. Thank you. Um, Julie, please. Thank you. Um, I want to speak in support of no fee caps on, on paraprofessionals. Um, I don't agree, or I believe that existing fee caps or fee regulation is not widespread uh, in the legal profession as is claimed by the legal services organizations. In fact, fee caps have not been set for modest means panels, as the staff memo pointed out. There are no fee caps for legal professionals, UDAs, LDAs, immigration consultants here in California or in other states that staff was able to find. Um, and the few existing fee caps that are around are not, they don't appear to be in the areas that the working group is considering as practice areas for paraprofessionals. And that would include at this point, family law, landlord, tenant, and collateral criminal. Um, the, the, the examples that were presented, um, micro workers comp probate, those are limits on contingency fees. Um, as far as I know, we are not allowing paraprofessionals to charge contingency fees or, or maybe that decision has not been finally made yet. Um, I agree with Judge Yu. I agree that with um, Tom Gordon and Jason Solomon, 
um, I'm persuaded by their public comment that the market will handle the fee issue. Um, and it will be excessively difficult for the bar or anyone else to administer a fee cap structure. Page six of the staff memo uh, and, and the, the May 14 letter from Professors Gordon and Solomon persuaded me on that. It will be very, very difficult. And as Judge Yu just said, there may be different caps in different counties. Um, that seems to just be a real problem for me that the, that the market could handle easily. Um, and I would not, uh, I, I agree mostly with what James Chang from Office of General Counsel said regarding the antitrust issues. I would not overlook that at all. Um, he's, I believe, he, I agree with him that if the cap or some sort of cap regulation system for fees is set by the legislature or the Supreme Court, that probably ends the discussion, but I don't agree with him on the proper method of delegation to either the this working group or the Board of Trustees. That seems to open the bar up to some serious antitrust issues raised by the US Supreme Court six years ago in the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners case. So I would not overlook that. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, can I just say one more thing? I, I agree with Judge Yu in that clients should know uh, about the fees being charged by the paraprofessional. Clients should also know what services the paraprofessional is proposing to provide. And I, I think the regulation committee could easily require some kind of disclosure on this and on the fact that um, those fees could be negotiated. They could be negotiated to be a flat fee. Um, so I, I, just, I just don't believe fee caps are necessary in this, um, uh, in this milieu, much as they are not imposed on attorneys. Thank you. Want me to call on folks, Justice Petru? Uh, no, just give me one second. Um, if I could please uh, hear from Nicole. Thank you. Um, I want to echo Claudia's sentiment for fee caps as a patient advocate um, and just unknown expenses that uh, a consumer may incur with medical expenses. And so for me, I would be looking for a fee cap because uh, as a patient advocate, my expenses are very, very tight. I have uh, enormous medical bills. And so for me, I would be looking if I needed to utilize a paraprofessional, I would actually be having to budget. Uh, another concern of mine would be income limits because a lot of programs that are out there, I may not qualify for. Uh, so I just wanted to echo that sentiment. I, I know there are a lot of uh, different nuances, but for me, I would have to say I would uh, welcome the fee caps. All right, thank you. Um, Amos? Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to thank you, Justice Petru, for putting this meeting together and focusing on this. This obviously is very controversial, difficult question. Uh, I think everyone knows I am in favor of fee caps or some sort of fee regulation, and I'd just like to take one step back to remind everybody, and, and sorry for doing this, but, but I think the history here is important. Obviously, as a working group, we have a dual goal of increasing access to justice, but also public protection. And one of the things we are doing here is proposing a new license um, that doesn't currently exist. And I think the promise of that is not just to increase um, access to justice, but also consumer protections. The idea is a licensed paraprofessional will take the place and displace a lot of what's happening now of unlicensed uh, people providing, providing legal services uh, and overcharging. Um, we have heard quite extensive objections or concerns about this program and proposed license from legal services, from consumer advocates, from uh, fraud and consumer protection prosecutors, and most of that, uh, this is an oversimplification, but most of that is around competency concerns and concerns about excessive fees. Um, and that is based on experience. There's people out there that are overcharging um, for because of the perceived inaccessibility of attorneys, uh, they're able to go and overcharge, significantly overcharge, um, victims um, who are, are defrauded. And so the promise of this license is to 
have a new licensees to have some regulation that promotes competency. But this is our chance to regulate fees, to regulate um, you know, excessive fees. And we can talk about you know, the, the examples in other contexts I think are very helpful. I, th I think that's great we put that together, but I think that's the second question of if we're gonna do this, how? The, the first question is, should we be regulating fees? And um, I think the answer is yes. And, and I don't think we wanna set it too low, um, but, but the, the risk in my opinion is not that people will be charged the same as if they went to an attorney, but they will be charged significantly more <laughs> than they would be charged if they went to an attorney. Um, and and uh, I, I do think Judge Yu, I think at one of the prior meetings suggested maybe an alternative could be disclosures and informed consent. Uh, and I, I really like that potential idea, but I can tell you I'm part of the regulation subcommittee and I don't think the proposal from the regulation subcommittee is gonna have a very uh, uh, significant informed consent requirement where alternatives of what attorneys or a low cost attorney might cost is gonna be provided. Uh, and so I think this is really the key way to address the, the, the one of the few risks that have been identified over and over, competency and excessive fees. Um, so, so I think we should look. And, and I've been convinced that it probably should be different in different practice areas. So for an example, I think an important example is in the housing context, eviction defense. As has already been mentioned, that's commonly done on a flat fee. Attorneys cost something in the neighborhood of $800 for the entire case, including trial. And so it would be a real shame if we didn't regulate fees at all and paraprofessionals could charge up to that or double that or triple that um, and not be able to handle the trial. And so right now, if we don't act, there's no, there's no regulation that the fee has to be reasonable, no discipline if there's unreasonable fees, no cap on fees. So this is our chance, I think, uh, and at least for, uh, you know, setting an hourly or a cap fee for unlawful de detainer defense. We heard the similar thing for consumer debt, um, that it's not a complicated. It might be much more complicated in family law, but for consumer debt or eviction defense, I don't believe it's complicated. Okay. Thank you, Amos. Um, Ira? Uh, I'm in favor of uh, fee caps. Um, one thing that I'm particularly in favor of is uh, uh, the limits on hourly rates. Um, I don't think that that's very hard to do. It's not the simplest thing in the world to do because it does vary by, uh, I think it should vary by area uh, of the state, maybe by county. Um, uh, but I don't think it's, you know, it's, you set, an, you set a rate for an area or for a county, and then you put in a uh, escalator for inflation, and you don't have to worry about what happens in the future. Um, and uh, that's a fairly simple um, regulation. Uh, it doesn't solve the, the problem of uh, too much, uh, of the fees being too high on an hourly rate, because you don't know what the hours are going to be, but it does something for it. Um, and, and there's some things like uh, Steve Fleischman pointed out that where a flat fee is quite appropriate, some things it's not. Um, and I, my, I have to disagree with my friend Julie um, about the market. Um, uh, people get ripped off all the time in, in open markets. Um, markets kind of are can be good in general, but they often that you know individuals they don't work for, um, like particularly the ones who get ripped off. Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, Carolyn. Are you able to join us from Airport Central? Oh, you're muted. Okay, I found a place in the airport where there's no one within 50 feet of me. And so I might be violating any kind of federal law, but hopefully um, if you see uh, marshals come and get me, you'll know why. Um, just super, super quick. There have been 
10 people or eight people who've spoken and eight opinions. And so, I mean, I agree with a lot of some people said, I disagree with a lot of other people have said, I've been on the LACPA uh, modest means panel for conservatorships in the past. I do practice uh, plaintiff's uh, contingency fee laws. I have made mark flat fees for people. So I have a lot of experience doing these things. There were 10 different statutes, maybe 15, that introduced uh, this the slideshow today. Each of those, I guarantee you, had thousands of hours of deliberation in our state legislature. The MICRA, MICRA, I mm -hmm. still don't know how to say it, CAP, um, has been the subject of probably, Steve will know this better than I, 50 appeals. Sure. Um, and <laughs> so anyway, my point is I would be against any CAPs. I think they're outside of the purview of what we can get due um, in the time that we have. There's just, you know, um, I agree with a lot of what everybody said in some places and a lot of, I just look at what we all have ourselves in terms of disagreement amongst us. So I'm gonna leave that and, and go back quiet. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, and I'm just um, raised the issue for myself that I have an ongoing concern that if fee caps were to be put in place, how one would go about determining what those are, because we certainly live in a very large and diverse state where it does not make sense to me that, you know, for example, someone mentioned um, in the unlawful detainer context, a flat fee amount in Sacramento. I don't think Sacramento is Los Angeles. I don't think that we can just blanket say, oh, that should be the top across the state. But um, I'm here to listen, not talk. There was, I thought there was another hand. It was uh, Fariba. Fariba? Oh, there you are. Hi there. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for all the great information and great input. I also agree and disagree with uh, many things I've heard. Uh, but I am against fee caps. I uh, I agree with Julian's comments, uh, Judge Yu's comments, and all the other comments in support of no fee caps. Um, at the self help center, we see a lot of uh, mm -hmm. people coming in uh, with comments exactly like Claudia and Nicole mentioned that they're not going to hire attorneys for the most complex of issues that they have. They want to come in here and do it here because they just don't know. They feel like they will lose control of how much this case will cost. And I'm not sure if the answer to that is fee, fee caps uh, for attorneys. Uh, I, I think for paraprofessional, I think the answer to that is client education, legal consumer education, that you can ask questions from attorneys, from paraprofessionals, and you should. And you know, if they don't answer the question, don't hire them. Um, and various ways of client education. Um, I have been really just um, concerned about the direction that we've been taking. And I have to share that with you since we can't talk to each other. <laughs> um, I feel like there's an end here is to fill this gap, representation, fill this gap. We want attorneys to charge less. We're not, we can't do that. So we're creating this new limited license uh, professionals and we're giving them all these powers to act as attorneys. They can give legal advice. They can do full in court representation. And yet we're gonna saddle them with fee caps and way, you know, informed consent way out there. All these disclosures, don't hire me, don't hire me. Here are these alternatives. And I just don't get that. I mean, if we are, if we want these folks to represent people, full representation, full legal advice, it's not fair to limit them and now tell them, yes, you have to act competently, but you cannot charge uh, a fee that's commensurate with your experience. So let's say there's a child support hearing. On one side of the aisle, we have a attorney representing one side and they don't have a fee cap. They could be charging $400 an hour. On the other side, we have an, a, a paraprofessional who's been told you cannot charge more than X amount. Maybe they'll do a better job than the other, the attorney on the other side at all, but they're told, you, what, what message are we giving them that you don't deserve to charge uh, a fee that's commensurate with your experience, just like the attorney is. So that is my concern that there's an end and everything else we're doing is to, uh, it, 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 the end is justifying everything else we're doing. And I think that's a backwards approach. I think our approach has to make sense, has to be logical. I think the market will, will 
will determine who can charge what. And I think client education, legal consumer education is the way to go. Thank you. Do we have, um, hold on one second, Stephen. I wanna see if there's anyone who has not been heard from who would like to say something at this juncture. All right, Stephen. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to your comments, Justice Petru. You know, as I view this issue, we'd be making recommendations that would eventually have to go to the legislature to be enacted. And I think the legislature, you know, this is kind of their bread and butter. And if they don't like the numbers we suggest, they can fix it. They can index it for inflation. They can have sunset clauses. They have a million ways to deal with all of the issues you're addressing, all of which are good issues. I personally would err on the side of fee caps on the higher side to take into account LA, Bay Area, those type of rates, because I'd rather do that than have a barrier to entry. But I still think fundamentally we, we can make recommendations and the legislature can adjust it. Got it. Um, Elizabeth? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm for fee caps, but those that have been speaking against it, I hear you. And those are very valid points. Um, but with that being said, um, the success of this program may be dependent on whether or not this fee cap issue is placed in this program. Um, because you're going to have people who are going to sit down and say, do I want to apply to be a paraprofessional? And they're going to say, I'm going to have to attend education program, get licenses to, and bonds to protect the public, advertise higher employees, and I have expenses. Um, do I want to, and then knowing that every time I take on a case, I'm going to be capped. So I just wanted to bring that forward that, you know, it might deter some people from actually signing up to become a paraprofessional. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out was um, that this for-profit model would alleviate the burden on legal aid and court um, self-help budgets, right? So it would transfer um, that, you know, those grants being overextended and all of that and just allow the for-profit model to work. Um, not having a fee cap will allow more clients to be served, I believe. And finally- And um, so I just wanna be clear, Elizabeth, so your position is that there should not be fee caps? Right, thank you. Um, and then current professionals have certain business expenses, right? And so, um, for example, I help the target demographic that are mostly Spanish speaking. And so even if I have, you know, I can run my business efficiently and have virtual questionnaires and intake forms and draft forms with software, um, my clients still want to come into a brick and mortar location and that's the way they get access. So some of them are not tech savvy. Some of them don't even have smartphones. Um, so that's, you know, some of the reasons why I feel the fee caps um, should not be placed. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Julia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess for me, I'm having a difficult time thinking about this in a vacuum. Um, if Stephen Hamilton has convinced Steve that for family law, this isn't appropriate. And I think if Stephen Hamilton wants to take, you know, whatever else he may have said uh, regarding this to the whole group, I think it would be helpful. But with that in mind, because of, I believe Stephen Hamilton and would probably follow his lead and guidance, um, then I am left with what, what activities are we talking about? What, what areas of the law are we talking about? Because I just, I can't even imagine what would be a fee uh, for, you know, in terms of one of the areas of law that we're discussing. And 
I have had a real education during this time. It was amazing to find out that someone is doing for $800 a trial in a case all over the state they're willing to go. So I think I'm feeling very torn. I like the idea of feed caps just because I too have dealt with certain parts of the attorney community that I think have not really been as ethical as necessary when uh, conducting the fee negotiation. And I've seen certain things that I'm not proud of that I saw. But I don't know that the fee cap is where we're going to solve this problem. If we are taking the point, position that they're not going to be in family law, then I guess what I need to do is where are we so convinced that there could be problems that we need to provide this extra protection? Then the only other thing I wanted to say is I think it's gonna be really hard to make this county by county. It just almost yeah. sounds unimaginable. And I think that if we do decide to do something, the easiest way I see to do it is to go to the high end market like LA and just say that would be the high end for anybody anywhere in California. Because I just can't even imagine the amount of time this one particular aspect of our work to make a truly uh, thoughtful recommendation about is gonna be done in a couple of meetings like this. I mean, it just sounds like a real big topic. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Dana? Yes. yes. This Where is Stephen Hamilton. What, can you call me on me eventually? I, I can't raise my hand. I'm on my iPhone because I'm, I do not get the privilege of using an airport today. I'm driving back and that's Okay. Well, since, we, since, since we've been taking your name in vain, why don't you go ahead and speak <laughs> right now? Okay. So the California Lawyers Association position, and that's the group that I represent, is we don't have enough anecdotal information to, to even take a position on the fee cap issue. Because um, we're not sure whether it's going to hurt the number that entered the profession versus be adverse to the goal of providing assistance to those who are not getting assistance. When we ultimately get to this vote, I would be abstaining. But I want to explain the comments that I had made to Steve Fleischman about family law in particular, because that's probably the, the main area of focus during the pilot program in terms of areas of law that will be covered. Um, I, there are attorneys that do do fee caps by contract in family law. It is not an encouraged practice because it essentially discourages you from doing all of the things you could do. You make more money per hour, obviously, if you do the least amount of work for the capped amount. Also, because of the number of issues that can come up, and many of them are very individualized to the case. In other words, you could take on a client and not realize that six months later, there's gonna be a domestic violence restraining order that needs to be filed, or you'll discover a hidden or undisclosed or undervalued asset that requires additional work. There's just so many permutations. I've never ever considered personally doing any kind of cap services. And generally speaking, what I see anecdotally is that the people that do get cap services because they're part of a, a service program, um, they, they have an, a, a legal insurance program that gives them X number of hours with, with uh, the attorneys that contract with that service, that the work that should be done does not get done. And there, there is, a, in some instances, a miscarriage of justice. So that's what I talked about with Steve Fleischman and, and Hopefully that put that in co context for the rest of the committee. All right, that's helpful, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, Dana? Thank you. I am against fee caps. I'm not gonna repeat the reasons that I've already heard here, but I will add something I haven't heard, which is I spent half my legal career in local government and many a good idea didn't move forward because of an inability to enforce or the lack of money to enforce. And I would worry about that with a complicated fee cap structure. Thank you. Sharon? I'm, I'm definitely in favor of fee caps. Um, Amos, your comments very much resonated with me. And throughout my career, I have seen um, you know, clients that, who have been overcharged 
in their most desperate hours, and that includes um, price gouging in time of disaster, etc. And that's despite a market um, happening. So you know those behaviors um, do happen. Um, but I also hear comments on the other side. Ultimately, it's really Claudia and Nicole's comments that um, really rang true to me. I think that as a, as a consumer, it's very hard to have the transparency of what to expect when you are overwhelmed with a legal problem and you are seeking services. And that's um, that goes to the heart of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create more avenues for access to justice. And we are looking at um, potentially clients that can't qualify for legal aid services, but have a little bit of money and are modest means, I think that um, fee caps um, are in order. I'm not saying that it's gonna be easy, but I would like to take a stab at considering them. Okay. Uh, Judge Harper. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the discussion because it's uh, brought up a lot of issues I've never thought about. And I, I appreciate both sides of this. And uh, but again, things that I'm concerned about, you know, we have 58 counties in this state and we've already talked about this issue. And I, and I think Carolyn really brought this up, um, the complications of, of fee caps and just even the information that was provided to us shows how different counties have different caps in different areas. I don't see how we're going to be able to make a fee cap rule that would be across the state. And if you want to say, well, LA is the high end, well, you know, that, then that's, there really is no fee cap for, for smaller counties then. So I, I just think we're getting into an area that's so complicated and it's gonna take so much time. And it is important, I understand that, but I, you know, kind of getting what Fariba was saying is we're getting, I think, away from where our, our purpose is here. We're gonna get so bogged down in this, it, we're gonna lose sight in, in what we're doing. So I, I just think that this isn't an issue um, that we need to take on um, because like I said, there's 58 counties, each county can have its own fee cap and own, I mean, I just don't know how you're gonna make a, a rule across, across the board for the state. So I, I'm, not, I'm not for fee caps. Judge uh, David Rubin. Good afternoon, everybody. And again, I apologize for being late. Um, I just briefly, uh, I, this has been a super, for me, educational conversation to listen to. Uh, when I hear Professor Torres Ambriz and I hear Ms. Robinson give me the consumer side of it, which uh, is very educational. Um, and then I hear um, other sides of it. And then I think maybe Mr. Hamilton came closest to capturing what I'm thinking, which I guess is the following. I think when I hear the consumer side of it, I think what I'm hearing, what I'm getting from it is something maybe we as a profession to think about more broadly is that that fee caps across the board, including attorneys, um, would be helpful so that consumers when they walk in to an attorney's office can know exactly how much an attorney can charge. Um, and so that that seems to be fairly broad, but we don't really have that on the table. The other part of me is thinking kind of what judge, well, like to Mr. Hamilton saying, I'm not sure I see data, at least in what I've looked at, it says fee caps will achieve what it is we want them to achieve. I'm not sure that they're necessarily the right tool. I just haven't seen anything one way or the other um, that says that, which makes me very reluctant to kind of wander into this area that as Judge Harper has described, is gonna be exceedingly difficult and exceedingly complicated. And as someone who sits on a body that does policy for 58 counties just from the court side, I sit on the judicial council, I can tell you that when you wander into the morass of the of 58 counties and the different details and the different corporate cultures that exist and the just different legal structures that exist in all these different counties, um, we, are, we are wandering into a very, very difficult place on a situation that I don't know that has been demonstrated yet exists. I'm not saying it won't necessarily in the future, exists, but that it just seems like there are other ways. I think someone talked about consumer education being kind of the way through. I'm assuming that when and if this passes the legislature that it would have a component of that. So I'm not for fee caps. I just don't see how they were demonstrated, how they really help the consumer in this particular instance. Um, and I can see how they could hurt. Julia? Thank you. Um, so I, 
I don't know if we have this information, but uh, I'll ask the question. Since we are providing a recommendation to, I think the Supreme Court and the Board of Trustees before it even goes further than that, do we have any guidance from those bodies as to whether they're interested in us tackling this issue? If not, could we, if, the, if not, I think that information would be helpful because I think it would tell us how to budget our time. The other thing that I was gonna say is if Amos has something in mind in particular uh, of a subject matter area or the regulations subcommittee um, can tell us the thoughts that have been circulated in that subcommittee, that to me would be very helpful as well so that I can actually envision what kind of tasks and practice areas we're considering. Uh, if, if, for example, following Stephen Hamilton's advice, we, we rule out family law because of all of the variations, do we have guidance from either the subcommittee, the board of trustees, the Supreme Court on this issue so we could know whether or not we're devoting our time um, towards something that is really contemplated as an issue for us? Do you want me to? Yeah, I do actually, Lee. I was about to turn to you on this. Yeah, so uh, just reviewing the charter, there is no specific call out of fee caps. However, there is um, you know, a directive to develop recommendations for regulation of the program and, and regulation of fees, I think fits squarely within that concept. So no, I, I don't think there's been a specific ask that this working group consider fee caps, but I, I do think it's entirely appropriate for the working group to do so if, if that's um, how you so choose. So I don't know if that's that helpful of an answer, but um, not specifically called out, but I think falls squarely under the concept of regulation. Do you want to move to Amos? Yeah, I was just actually pondering your answer because I'm just not quite sure what to do, you know, um, with that. But anyway, this is my puzzled look. Amos. Yeah, first of all, I want to agree with what Leah just said, because um, again, when we looked at what regulation, what, what are the risks we want to regulate, excessive fees was number two um, out of a short list. Um, so I think it squarely falls within, if we're going to be regulating this, again, we all have to, I think, take off our judge hats and our lawyer hats and put on regulator hats in creating this new system. But to respond specifically um, to Julia's comments, I very much appreciate your comments, Julia. I do think in a vacuum, it's hard. And especially when, when one of the major objections is this is too difficult, it's too complicated. There's a lot of counties a lot of different practice areas, a lot of different tasks. I do think that might apply to family law. I don't know that it applies very well to either housing and specifically eviction defense or consumer debt. Uh, and so it might be that we consider different approaches for the different practice areas. I know in LA where I practice, there are low cost legal services available um, uh, outside of the legal services free context, but uh, for eviction defense to go to a BASTA. Or I, so, so if I could jump in at that point, Amos, it's, you know, I just want to highlight something that Judge Harper said, because I think it is true that in the larger counties, there is more available um, already to people at low or no cost. And so, I mean, I just want to reemphasize that, that, you know, for all that some of the larger counties, which is great, have programs and have more programs that are going to be getting rolled out, which is what we want it to be, for example, to be sure not to interfere with Los Angeles's program, um, providing assistance to people in unlawful detainer actions. You know, uh, in the smaller counties, there's not going to be that kind of availability. And we do need to think about um, how fee caps would be handled in that context, whether fee caps are being done statewide, whether that even has any impact in the lower counties because the fees would be lower there by virtue of the marketplace. And also, again, um, you know, more than one person has raised the um, tension between wanting to keep the fees low, but not having it be that this that we're so disincentivizing 
people from going into this profession that we don't have the people available at all, which again is going to be, I believe, a bigger issue in the smaller counties than in the big ones. So sorry to cut you off, but I don't want to lose that. Yeah, so I appreciate that, but I think my point is, is very different. My point has to do with the need for fee caps and how difficult it would be to set fee caps. So I do agree that um, one of the reasons why we're doing this program is legal services may not be available to everyone statewide or, or maybe different in, in some counties and in, in rural counties. So, so as far as the need for the program, I think that, that, that comment is well taken. But as far as setting a fee cap that might be appropriate in an, for eviction defense, I don't think that would be difficult. I think we could easily find out how much it costs or what, what legal services are available to uh, defendants in landlord tenant eviction cases um, and set a, a cap. Uh, I'm explaining that in Los Angeles, it's very easy to do. In Sacramento, it's easy to do. We have some examples of sure. some other counties where it's often done on a flat fee. So this isn't the complicated situation where um, you know, there's all different right. kinds of class, all, all different kinds of complications. It's, it's probably pr relatively uh, easy. Maybe that's an oversimplification. We'd have to spend some time, but in Los Angeles, okay. it's an $800 flat fee. It might be 750 in Sacramento. There might be some state variations, but it, it would be a, a real problem if somebody is charged, you know, $2,000. And they um, could so the trial. Okay, so that we know what we're doing. My thought is to go until about three and then take a little break. I would like to get comments from everyone. One area though that hasn't gotten much discussion because I don't think there's actually any controversy, but I'd like to know whether there is, is fee caps in the context of um, contingency fees. Is there any, keep your hands up. I already see whose hands are up, um, Sharon Elizabeth and Stephen Fleischman. But is there anyone who thinks there should not be any kind of capping in the context of contingency fees? Okay, so we can table that for when we start voting on things, but it just struck me that, that that's just not a controversial topic. Um, Elizabeth? Wait, Your Honor, Your Honor. Um, oh, yeah. This is Carolyn. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Carolyn. Carolyn Shining, contingency fee lawyer. There you go. <laughs> Take it away. Well, and here's the problem, Your Honor. It's in some ways, I think this has been an amazing stalking horse. And the issues of contingencies go very, very, very far back and deep in our American culture. And there are a lot of people who believe that there shouldn't be contingency fees at all. I think I called this the American rule the last time we talked about it. It's not the American rule, it's just history. Um, and, um, but let's just, in specific, people have brought up micro caps. That cap was set in 1975. It was set somewhere in the middle of the 1970s. And any effort to increase that has been absolutely, has been fought over and fought over and fought over. And, and those who are here saying, you know, there's a lot of different people who are saying, I'm against caps on fees that should apply to contingency fees if we're going to go that route. And again, I am not certain in terms of the way we have set up this program to be so far reaching in terms of subject matter, and you, you, you know, the, the working group knows me, I'm, I'm a straight shooter, that we can really discuss that in a vacuum. I think it'd be discussed in a vacuum at all. I think it's a stalking horse, if I may be fresh, for the next group that's gonna come in and discuss the relaxation of regulations to allow um, AI and different kinds of technologies to come in and, and figure out what they're gonna do. So I just think it's, it's really a phenomenally broader issue that has implications that go back literally to the 1800s in our country as whether or not we're gonna cap contingency fees in any way, shape or form across any subject matter whatsoever. Um, you know, antitrust or not antitrust, this is the way America has done it. If we're going to have you're breaking up on us. Attorneys are in discipline as attorneys are. Okay. Well, um, yes. Um, we got anyway, you until I the think last. My point. Yeah, yeah and it was it was clear till just the very last couple of seconds. Okay, I, I think I made my point. Right. I just the the there are those a lot of those caps, those regulations have been in place for years and years and, years. and so let's not think that if we just 
say one thing is okay across the board, someone can come in and change it later. This will be in effect unless the, unless the sandbox uh, center, the other justice gap committee comes back and, and has a relaxation of, of further things that we do and they can do that. Um, I just, uh, I don't think it's blithely easy to say, let's just cast those two. Yeah, I gotcha. All right, thank you, Carolyn. You are not uh, either, if I may also comment on this topic. Okay. Uh, I believe in the rules and regulations committees, we were talking about allowing for contingency fees for enforcement. And I'm gonna ask, I wonder if Amos or Leah can kind of chime in on that. I think we were talking about a cap on those. Leah? Yeah, no, I think so. That, I, I'm sure that was gonna be your recommendation. Um, if contingency fees are allowed, it would only be allowed in this very limited area and that you would be recommending a cap on the contingency fee. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, so going back to the um, fee caps, um, I wanted to share an example of what we have seen with our members um, at the California Association of Legal Document Assistance. Um, these LDAs don't have a cap. Um, however, the market, let's say, for example, in Riverside County, where there is a lot of legal aid available, there's still a lot of need for LDA assistance. Um, the market has determined what they are going to pay for an uncontested divorce. Um, for example, um, because of the amount of LDAs in that area, the competition is very high. The more educated the self-represented litigant knows about LDAs, the more they seek the services and the harder it is for an LDA to charge higher than any other LDA in that county. Um, so again, I just wanted to share um, that perspective because they're doing the kind of work that these paraprofessionals would do similarly. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Steven Fleischman. Hi, Linda, is it possible for you to put our charter on the screen so we can all look at it? Yes, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. Because I recall there's something about consumer protection specifically in the charter. While Linda's doing that, I, I, I disagree with people that say this is too complicated. I, I really don't think it is. If we set 750 across the board for an unlawful detainer across the state, if that's encapsulating what the going rate is in LA, every that that could cover the whole state. And again, so, it's so how does that provide a I mean, if your point is consumer protection, how does that provide consumer protection to the county where attorneys are doing it for let's say 350? Because I'm only talking about it being a cap not to exceed. If the market value in that county is less, then it'll come down. I'm only talking about placing a cap. Well, I understand that, but to me, there's an internal inconsistency to say that in some county, the market will take care of it, whereas in another county, it's gonna really be the cap that's doing it, just to push back on you on that. Oh, okay, I, re I respect that. I, I, to me, it's more important that there be a cap than what the cap is. Mm -hmm. And I would be in favor of using LA as an example because it's a big market. Keep sure. in mind that the paraprofessional cannot do everything the attorney can do for that same flat fee or cap, whatever, however we style it. Um, looking at the charge, the second sentence of the first paragraph, in carrying out this charge, the working group will balance the dual goals of ensuring public protection and increasing access to justice. I'm, I'm sorry, access to legal service. So ensuring public protection is what we're talking about today. That seems to me squarely within our charter. Thank you. One thing I, I just want to quickly say is um, if we are going to go down the route of setting a statewide cap, I would suggest we would need to think about using LA 
um, because the highest, most expensive areas to live in our state, it's not LA, it's the Bay Area. And for example, those employers that have, uh, in California, that have regional rate structure, salary structures for their staff, their staff in the LA area are paid less than their staff in the Northern California area. So I just wanna point that out, that if we're gonna go that route, it's, it probably should not be LA that we are pegging to. Okay. Sharon? Did we just lose? Sure. No, she's on mute. You're muted, Sharon. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my bad, Zoom etiquette here. <laughs> uh, there are models, some successful models out there of um, both organizations and attorneys that use a sliding scale, um, you know, where they can still make a good living, but that does provide um, some consumer protection with like a cap. Um, that was my first point. My second point is if we're not going to use a city like LA or San Francisco as the upper end. I don't think it would be that difficult to go county by county and to figure out what an average rate is for an area of law and set it that way. So if you're in a rural county, it may be a few hundred dollars less per hour, but we can, we can do that fairly easily if that's the route that we wanted to go down. Any other comments at this juncture? Obviously, we're not done. Um, Leah, oh, uh, Monica. Sorry, um, I, I just wanted to throw out there because I think everyone uh, thus far has given their input. Um, I am not in favor of caps for, for three, I think three real basic reasons. Um, one, I, I think they would be very unwieldy to structure and difficult to administer. Um, having heard everyone's comments, um, I'm, I'm still convinced that, that this is um, something that I, I think we would have to get very, very deep into the weeds on uh, in a way that I don't know that we want to do. Um, I also think that it would be a disincentive for people to become paraprofessionals if they know going into it that there is there are these caps on various things that they're going to do. Um, and then finally, I don't want to see attorneys weaponize the fact that there are caps uh, against paraprofessionals. And um, in litigation, I can see that easily taking place and easily happening. So um, I, I do agree that I think that the market will correct itself um, if necessary on this. Um, and consumer education is, is really what's important to combat uh, any excessive fees. All right, thank you, Judge Wiley. Um, okay. Leah, any suggestions? I mean, at this point, I, I really, I don't know where the bulk of the group sits on this. And I feel like I would like to have a sense for whether the majority does or does not think that there should be fee caps in at least some circumstances, okay? Not necessarily all, but I think it would be helpful um, in order to inform our discussion, our next phase of our discussion to figure out where people sit. I am not in a position where I can make any kind of a motion, um, but if there is someone who would like to make a motion, if only to get, it doesn't even have to be phrased the way that you agree, but just to get a sense for whether the majority of the working group thinks that there should or should not be fee caps. And again, not necessarily fee caps in every circumstance, but in other words, whether the majority does or does not think that there should not be fee caps at all. Um, oh, someone else would other, like to suggest a different way to move forward at this juncture. Other than contingency fee caps, right? Did you want to bifurcate that issue? Um, I guess we probably should, and then we can discuss that. Uh, the comma instead of a period at the end, Linda. And would people like, because I was going to take a break at three o'clock, um, as I mentioned, but I do, I don't know. Well, let, yeah, let's take a break at three, kind of no matter what, because um, I think, you know, we've been going a couple of hours and people need a break. Carolyn, you have your hand up? Uh, yes. Um, would the word restrictions be better than caps? Um, caps have different... Uh, uh, connotations, or we can do like lawyers do and we can use a string of things, three words, caps, <laughs> restrictions, and or something else. But I think restrictions, and I'll say this, restriction might be a better term. Judge you. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry, I forget to unmute. 
Um, I was going to make the motion, but use the word caps because I'm concerned we haven't discussed restrictions per se. And to me that mm, actually is more expansive than caps. And we've all talked about caps. There's a record of caps. We've, but this is recorded. We know what we're talking about. So okay. I was willing to kind of just make the motion to see where people are. Here we are. Yeah. Okay. And so the way that it currently reads, let me just read it out loud. And then judge, you also ask if you would like to have any modifications to it as the person moving. It states resolves that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group recommends that the paraprofessional program will place no caps is so awkward. How about will not place caps on the fees that licensed paraprofessionals will be authorized to charge with the exception of contingency fees. Judge you are you okay with that? Uh, yes, I guess I would only just say contingency fees where those fees are allowed, but I, that makes it too long. So I'm happy with, the, with what's on the screen. And Julie, you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to say we could say limits instead of caps unless it's too close to restrictions and you don't like that, judge you. <laughs> I Maybe we could do what Carolyn suggested, no caps, limits, or restrictions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I think we'll understand when we come back to this. So I'm okay with limits. Okay. If other people feel like that's clear enough. Well, we can see, um, and then Julie? Uh, yes, I was just going to second Judge Yu's motion. Okay, great. So we have a second okay. from Can Julie. I, can I, yeah, can I make a question or before we, yeah, or I understand why we are coupling the fee issue to the contingency fee issue. They seem to be two completely different issues to me. And so when we take a straw poll or a vote or whatever we do now, uh, I just think it should be. Uh, decoupled so that I understand, we all understand uh, where people stand on these two totally separate issues. I'm not aware of having a meeting on this contingency fee issue, right. except in random discussions here and there. The other thing um, is someone mentioned that this is being recorded. However, it's my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, that these video recordings are only kept for 30 days, and then they are, um, something happens I, to I them don't no know. Linda or Leah, public. can you answer that question? I don't believe that's the case. These, these video recordings oh, okay. uh, for past meetings of the of the state bar, the video recordings are available on the state bar's website in perpetuity. Yeah. And is it all right if I jump in before yes. I speak? And I'm sorry to do so. Maybe based on what Carolyn said, we could just say, with the exception of contingency fees, if uh, if they are going to be allowed or something like that, because we don't want to presume that we've talked about it as a group and that we agree on that we're going to allow that. I don't know if that wholly addresses Carolyn's issue, but it may address it somewhat. Okay, uh, Judge Wiley, did you wish to make a comment? Oh, you're muted. No, no thank you, I'm fine. Okay, take your hand down, please. Um, Julia, did you have something else? No, I don't, thank you. Okay, so if, if folks don't have comments, if they could please take their hands down because I'm going through everyone's hands. Um, Stephen Fleischman. I, I just wanna clarify with Erica, if I'm in favor of fee caps, I'm voting against your motion, correct? Right, because this says not this says it will not place limits on the fees. And so if you think there should be limits, you're a no vote. Thank you. Carolyn. Again, uh, with regard to statutory construction, now we've got something that is a like Steve kind of pointed out. It's negative, then a positive, and then a negative again. So I really no, think we, I understand. I agree motion, that it's not. Would... Yeah. Um, so here's the issue that I think Leah was trying to address: is that there has, and you're correct that there has not been a whole fulsome discussion about this. There have been. Um, some discussion in various contexts regarding contingency fees. My recollection has been um, that it, it, when we've talked about fee caps or fee limitations in the past, some people have mentioned that you know there are limits on the percentage that can be recovered in a contingency basis and that it would make sense to carry over similar things here. So for example, a cap of 40% or whatever it is. 
So I certainly recall that having come up on various occasions, which I think is why Leah suggested that we carve that out from here, because if we were to simply say that the group will not place limits on fees, period, um, that maybe there's someone who thinks that it's okay for contingency fees, but not otherwise, but maybe I'm wrong. And it could be that this has simply become too convoluted of a motion. And I'm turning to judge you who is moving to see how she would like to handle this. I still would like to have a motion. I'm willing to change the wording if that's an issue for people. Yeah, I think we have to have a motion. The question is, what does it say? I'm satisfied with this. Okay, and how about who was the second? Me, Second. Julie Thomas. And, and, and um, Julie, are you fine with it as it's written? Uh, yes. Okay, well then we have a first and we have a second. Um, and do we need further discussion before a vote, Carolyn? Yeah, just one more point. Again, this says we will not place it with the exception of something we will place it, except if that is, is allowed. This suggests that with the exception of contingency fees. And again, I would argue to the court <laughs> that that means we're going to allow contingency fees. So I don't understand why we've got three different points in one. It, let's just make it easy. Um, do we want to place limits on fees? Do we want to place them? Maybe we start with contingency fees. Well, um, you know what, yeah, actually, is... what I would suggest to cut to the chase here, because then um, I would um, suggest to you, judge you, unless you're not comfortable, what is your position? You are moving. Is it your position that you recommend that we not place limits other than potentially in the context of contingency fees? Yeah, my, what I, since it was already up, I didn't go ahead to express the motion, but my motion would have been that the paraprofessional working group recommend that there be no caps or limits on fees that would be charged by paraprofessionals with the exception, with the potential exception of contingency fees if those are allowed, but they're not allowed yet, so we don't know. Judge you, this is Judge Rubin. Let, yes. me, let me just, as I'm looking, I like the way you worded that, but I was wondering if we dropped the last sentence having to do with contingency yeah. fees, because it just hasn't been addressed. Okay. How that would, but I like the way, and I think it goes to what Ms. Shining, her, her talk about kind of where we sort of phrase this in the negative. Can um, I? And so maybe if we did it the way you just stated it, it was a little more clear. And I don't know if you remember what you just said, but <laughs> that's what my suggestion. Yeah. So if you could, Linda, I think you deleted it, but it actually needs to go back out there. And after the word with the, you put potential with the potential exception of contingency fees, period. I would take that out. I would just say, Resolve that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group, what an acronym. All right. Yeah. I mean, honest. Anyway, recommends that the, that no, I would put it maybe more positive that the, that no, that the paraprofessional program, um, that there will be no limits. I wanted to try to recast it in the positive. So when you vote yes, it's a yes on that. Okay. Concept. All right. So if I could please make a suggestion. Um, well, you are the Linda. Judge, so I say yes. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you for permission, David. Uh, so, resolved that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group recommends that there be no limits on the fees. So, you know, delete all the words between there and on. that there be no limits on the fees that licensed professionals will be authorized to charge. And then I leave it up to the people moving at this last phrase. So then I would say charge period as Judge Rubin suggests, and then say a second sentence, which is the question of caps on potential or potential caps on contingency fees will be discussed at a later time or something like that. Because I, I do think we don't, if we do, yeah. Agree, agree on contingency fees later. We don't want to have conflicting resolutions, and so we need to capture or you know save space for that somehow. Agreed. I, that, that's that makes it very clear. Okay. Yeah, I think that's um, all right. So I'm going to read it out loud. Resolved that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group recommends that there be no limits on the fees that licensed professionals will be authorized to charge. Period. 
The question of potential caps on contingency fees will be discussed at a later time period. Um, Judge Yu, are you fine with that? I am. Thank you and so much. Second? Yeah, yes, second I'm the seconder, Julie Felmuth, and I, I was just trying to get at the, you know, on page one of the PowerPoint, there's two primary questions, and the first one is, should paraprofessional fees be capped? And the answer is no. I don't okay. object to the second sentence, though. Okay. All right. So with that, um, why, Linda, why don't you go ahead and take a vote, and then we're going to take a break. Okay. Um, Bashan. No. Brennelson. No. Uh, Felmuth. Yes. Fleischman. No. Hamilton. Abstain. Judge Harper. Yes. Hartston. No. Kirkmeyer. Yes. McRae. Yes. Olvera. Yes. Robinson. Abstain. Judge Rubin. Yes. Shining. Yes. Sarush. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Spyro. No. Torres and Breeze. No. Judge Wiley. Yes. Judge Yu. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 10, uh, yes, one, two, three, four, six, no, and two abstentions. So the motion carries. Okay, let us um, take a 10 minute break, please, and resume at 315. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Linda, could you please take, yeah, thank you. And if folks could turn on their video, if only momentarily, just so I know that people are back, that would be helpful. Other than Carolyn, who I know is at the airport. Yes, I'm back. Thank Hi, you. Claudia. Hey. Uh, do we have Sharon here? Okay, well, let me um, get started. I, I just, you know, the, the vote was taken and the vote was clear, but I do wanna say, I think there were a lot of legitimate concerns raised during the course of the discussion this afternoon, uh, both by members of the working group and by members of the public who called in and made public comment. And I don't want to give those concerns um, short shrift or lack of consideration by, you know, in any way or to any extent and to that end, though I am planning on ending this meeting early today, not going until five o'clock. Um, to that end, though, I think, and you know, Lee and I had a chance to very briefly discuss this during the break, that it would be a very good use of our time, you know, our remaining time this afternoon, to talk about what we want the regulation subcommittee to consider with an eye towards the concerns that were raised today and the reasons that were raised for wanting to have the potential for fee caps in at least some areas. Um, for example, one thing is that attorneys are not required to report fees. Maybe paraprofessionals should be. Maybe with starting up a new program, it would be very useful for the state bar to have information concerning the fees that are getting charged. And maybe they look at that in five years and go, oh, you know, this system's really seems to be regulating itself beautifully. Or maybe they look at it and go, wait a minute, why are they charging more than attorneys for the same thing? And so that once there's some information out there, there's the opportunity to um, modify the program accordingly. So that's one thing that we briefly discussed. There are obviously other things, but I think that it would be useful to use some time this afternoon to give further consideration to the very legitimate concerns that were raised on behalf of arguing for fee caps and how can we potentially address those concerns at least to some degree. So I, I mean, I open up the floor. So this is Julia, I think that's an excellent idea. And I also thought that maybe, you know, there could be, I, I guess, Your Honor, are you speaking of having it done at the end of the year or tracking it as they go by, for example? I, you know, I haven't thought about it in, into that level of granularity because this is not something that's in place, right? This isn't something where there's already an existing program for attorneys that you could turn to and say, well, they do it on a quarterly or they do it, you know, on an annually or how is it that we would do it? Um, so I think it's something that would need to be uh, discussed. Well, I like the idea that it be done quarterly because I think uh, whether whether or not we're going to let them sign under the penalty of perjury, or we're just gonna have them send it in, or maybe even require a copy of their agreement. Um, I mean, I think that should be part of regulation is that somehow their agreements to, I mean, we should have, I think, certain requirements that their uh, paraprofessional client agreement has in terms of disclosures, information, the education that we're all now learning, at least I am, about additional free services so that they are educating the consumer at the same time as accepting representation. And perhaps the, the whole agreement could be, you know, outlined in terms of what those disclosures have to be so that they know that there may even be an alternative outside of a paraprofessional for them. And that perhaps, you know, whatever document you think the state bar might want to take the time to review. I don't know if they're every single attorney, not attorney, but paraprofessional agreement, or is once they get licensed, do they have to lodge one with the state bar? I don't know, but I think that is a way to protect the consumers. All right, thank you, Julia. Stephen Fleischman? Yeah, I just want to start by saying, even though I was on the losing end of the vote, I thought that was the best discussion we've ever had. I was. Uh, it was fantastic. 
In terms of going forward, I think recommending that the state bar develop a standard form retainer agreement is a good one. I think part of that form should include a budget. So at least the client has some idea going in what to expect. I've mentioned before, I think it should include billing in 10th of hour increments instead of quarter hour increments. Um, you know, specifics like do I bill for travel time should be addressed? Is legal research going to be charged? I mean, there's a whole list of things that should be disclosed. Photocopy, I mean, ev everything. Just my thoughts. Thank you. Leah, did you want to chime in while we're waiting for other comment? Yeah, I'm just wondering what people would think about um, a not to exceed amount in the fee agreement that's negotiated between the client and the paraprofessional. Understanding it's really difficult to do that at the beginning of the case, so this not to exceed amount is probably going to be pretty high, but really taking to heart what we heard from Nicole and Claudia about you know, the value of no, and I know myself as a consumer, you want to know what this is going to cost you. So even if it's a high amount, it, at least you have a dollar amount. So wondering what people think about that concept. I like that concept. I, I, I thought we just voted against that concept. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be set, it wouldn't be set by us. It's basically set by the paraprofessional and the client. It wouldn't be set by us. It would be, you know, I go into the paraprofessional, we talk about my issue and, you know, we get to this place where the paraprofessional says, I think this is probably going to cost you about $5,000 and that's our not to exceed amount. I just like to know, like, if it's something that would be affordable to me. So affordability would be, that's key to me. So, I, I mean, I would like having that option versus having none, so... Carolyn? Well, I guess I just, this again, you know, Steve said this is, you know, we voted a lot of this out and we're trying now to bring it back in again. And um, this is shows the complexity of things. You know, is there any other way we can bring this, motion, this, this issue back in? Is there any other way it can be restated in a way that brings it back somehow? I completely respect the comments of you know, are, are the, the people who reference the consumer concern that things are being too expensive. You know, it's it's not the same thing, but you know, we're ethically unable as lawyers to say to a client, this is what you're going to get from this case. This is what I this is what our result is going to be. You know, you're gonna get a million dollars. I'm gonna be able to do X, Y, Z for you. We have an ethical prohibition on saying that whatsoever. And I think this, you know, any other things that were kind of that are in this vein that it's brought up, it could slide into that sort of thing. So, but I just, you know, here we are kind of going back. I, I don't know why we're, you know, we, I don't know. I don't want to go back on what we've already voted for. And, Carolyn, and do you have an issue? Um, do you have an issue with the concept of a simple reporting of fees so that there can be some assessment down the road on how the paraprofessional fees are lining up as compared with attorneys? There you have privacy issues. You know, you've got issues with regard to consumers having their issues now um, related to the state bar or to whatever agency. So you've got a massive amount of privacy issues there. So that's an important issue to flag for the regulation committee to consider. Okay, um, Elizabeth. Um, so kind of um, to Leah's point, something that some of the LDAs are doing right now kind of is like a not to exceed fee when they do contracts such as um, flat fees, flat fees. So when the um, consumer signs the contract, they know more or less what they're gonna pay. And that doesn't put a cap by you know the state bar on what they're allowed to, but it does give the consumer an idea of what they're gonna pay. And then it says, um, you know, and this is what you're gonna get for that flat fee. And if, yeah, so that's, yeah, thank you. Uh, David. Thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to say, I think I agree with Ms. Shining's comments. I might have phrased them a little differently, but uh, I think I agree. I think we've discussed this. It seems like we've made our decision. I think 
On the other hand, again, kind of tipping my hat to Ms. Robinson and um, Professor Torres Ambrose that that further kind of tracking it um, would be a value. I think Ms. Shining is right. There are going to be attorney client issues, but I think there might be a way to do a blind tracking and just having paraprofessionals, assuming they have enough clients, you're not, you know, if you have one client and you tell what, there might be a way of just doing kind of a blind tracking of kind of what are your fees or what's the range of your fees so we can kind of see this going forward to see if maybe down the road, a couple of years, if it happens that we would be in a position to say, gee, there was no need for it or gee, it seems like there may need be a need for it if there's something we missed. Anyone else or anyone else either on this or have other things that they would wish regulation um, to consider? Well, I would, this is Julia again. I would just say that if, if we are concerned about privacy and the, the re self reporting would become problematic for the client, then I really do agree with Steve Flashman that it, I think it's very important that the model contract be approved by the state bar and that it be like a mandatory judicial counsel form. I, I think if if we we don't tell them what we want, we give them what we want. And it's mandatory use or something. Anyone else or Leah, any comments from you? No, just that I think you also should expect then a proposal on the contingency fee piece from the regulation subcommittee as well. We didn't take that up today, and I know that they are discussing that. Right, which to me means we should not be taking it up today, correct? Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, if they're in process of discussing it, we'll have something to propose. I don't think that now's the time for us to be talking about it. Um, Elizabeth? Um, so I just wanted to share that um, the legal document assistants have a contract that they are required to use um, that um, we can kind of use as a sample or at least just consider and look at it. Um, it's governed by the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, it's cited in Business and Professions Code Section 6410 that says every LDA who does this kind of work needs to have a contract in place. And so it lists out certain disclosures um, such as I am not an attorney. Um, in our case, you know, we would put we are able to give legal advice. But I just wanted to bring that up in case we needed a model to um, look at. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, unless anyone has anything, I think we're done. Shockingly, ninety <laughs> minutes early. <laughs> Okay, well, I know that Judge Yu has a four o'clock meeting. Carolyn, you have a flight to catch, which we hope goes smoothly for you. Um, and I hope everyone else has a good afternoon as well. Um, Leah, do you have any comments before we wrap up? No, I just agree with Steve. It was a great discussion. All right, well, thank you all and I'll see you all soon. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.